please can you tell us a little bit about your talk today? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a real honour to be talking at this and nice to be speaking outside of our normal little mining bubble as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about how we feel that lithium is going to be playing a key role in the energy that's coming. One of the major problems facing us at the moment is climate change. And if we want to mitigate climate change, we need low carbon technologies. A lot of those are focused around battery power and lithium is a key component of those. So I'll also mention how we're going to, what we're doing in Cornwall and how that fits into the wider EU. So hopefully it'll be interesting. <laughs> sure it will be. So uh, are you ready, Lucy, to kick off with your talk? I am. I'll just press go on my timer because I am prone to talking. So yes. Well, you start, your 20 minutes starts now. Thank you. Oh. Right. So as Gillian kindly said, I'm a geologist at Cornish Lithium. I joined the company three years ago now, which has whizzed by. So, and I was the first geologist on the team then. So we now have a team of 11 geoscientists based down in the Southwest. So it's built up quite quickly and it's quite an exciting opportunity. So hopefully I'll give you a sense of that in the next 20 minutes. You're very welcome to read this disclaimer afterwards, but it basically says don't invest in anything on the back of what I've said. <laughs> so I started to introduce Cornish Lithium, um, kind of does what it says on the tin. We're focused on exploring for lithium down in Cornwall. And Cornwall's got this amazing heritage of tin and copper mining, but actually in the past, it's also produced cobalt. There were two specific cobalt mines in Cornwall. There was gold, there's silver. It's produced a whole suite of metals. And in the last 20 or 30 years, since the tin price crashed internationally in 1985, South Crofty hung on until 1998, I think it was. But really, there's been no true metal mining in the UK since then. And that's not because the regions run out of metal, run out of ore, rather kind of trends moved, people moved away, and then it's kind of been a slightly forgotten about jurisdiction since then. But by applying modern exploration techniques to it, and also looking for a suite of metals that weren't necessarily of interest before, we think that there's really significant potential down here still. I'll then talk about why lithium, what we think the opportunity is around it, and then we'll look a little bit more into the tech of how lithium is currently extracted and from different parts of the world. Then we'll zoom in and focus on what we're looking at in Cornwall at the moment. And I'll talk a little bit about the two drilling programs that we managed to complete two days before lockdown, um, which was good timing. And then finally, there's a lot of synergies between what we're doing and the potential for geothermal energy. So I'll touch on that as well. So I wanted to start with this slide and the phrase that if something hasn't been grown, then it's been mined. And I think it's quite a powerful statement, especially when you're trying to engage with people who are outside of our industries. Everything that we use in our daily lives has either been extracted from the ground or it's been grown. And we've been doing quite a lot of schools out. And it blows people's mind that two thirds of the elements from a periodic table can be in your smartphone. All of those have been sourced from different mines around the world with different processing techniques. These really are global supply chains. Um, if you think about things like a wind turbine, for example, a standard three megawatt wind turbine has five tons of copper wiring in it. It's got two tons of rare earth elements. It's got 1200 tons of concrete. Houses are built out of things that have been mined. Obviously, you're from the oil and gas industry. You fully understand how pervasive that is through society. We need these extractive items, which means that we need to take stewardship of them and start to extract them as responsibly as we possibly can. And as we transition to this decarbonized economy in the future, we actually need to mine a hell of a lot more to enable this. There's a statistic from the World Bank that in the last 5,000 years, we've mined about 550 in the next 25 years, purely for low carbon technologies. Can you hear me okay? I'm gonna carry on. Yeah, we can, Lucy. Yeah, it just came up with my internet connections unstable, but hopefully not. So looking at lithium then, lithium mining is an industry that's in its infancy. So the first lithium ion battery was actually commercialized in 1991. So I talked about how metal mining in Cornwall, for example, kind of really fell into decline in the mid eighties. 
people weren't even looking for lithium then there was no point in mining it so nobody's really assessed the reason region's potential for it and the reason that lithium is now on people's radars is because it's the lightest weight metal and it's got a really high charge density so if you want something for a battery, for example, that's lightweight and portable, then lithium really is the optimal charge carrier for you. And if you look at this graph from McKinsey on the right, it just shows lithium use. And you can see that in 2010, only 14% of all lithium in the world was used in batteries. By 2017, that had gone up to, what, two thirds? And then actually by 2025, it is gonna be the vast use of lithium. And there's also a kind of tripling in demand for the metal. There's a really interesting um, report that came out by the World Bank uh, just a couple of weeks ago, actually, and it's, it's called Mineral Intensity of This Climate Transition. And I'd really encourage you all to read it, the summary especially, is quite hard hitting. And it shows that to, to decarbonize the economy, if we want to combat climate change, which arguably, corona aside, is one of the biggest challenges facing, facing humanity at the moment without sounding too lofty. It means we need to decarbonize the economy. To decarbonize our energy mix, we need to build you know, low carbon technologies such as wind turbines, we need solar panels, and we need battery storage of all of these things, which actually means we, we need to mine a hell of a lot more over the next couple of decades than we have been doing. I think they reckon that by 2050, we need to be mining 500% more battery materials than we have been previously. If you then take into account that in the mining industry, it takes on average about 10 years from finding a deposit to actually producing it, the industry's got a hell of a lot to do in the very near future to be able to keep up with this demand. So what's driving this? It's this energy transition. And actually for lithium, one of the key drivers excuse the pun, is the rise of electric vehicles. And it's actually being written into, you know, countries, governments, and the EU, for example, are all aiming to have 100% electric vehicles by, in Norway, they're aiming to, for all new vehicles to be 100% electric by 2025. And it's this that's really impacting this increasing future demand for lithium. So that's all well and good, but where do we actually find lithium? As an element itself, lithium isn't that rare, but finding it in places where it's concentrated enough to make it economically viable to extract is a bit more difficult. So this graph's a couple, well, this map's a couple of years out of date now, but you can see that in 2017, and it's probably fairly similar for the last year, global lithium production was dominated by two sources, South America, where it comes from salar brine deposits, and then Australia, where it comes from a hard rock mineral called spodumene. What's important to note about this map is actually the lack of any significant production from North America, Africa, Europe, and also from China. So China actually account for, I think, probably 90, 95% of all lithium processing, but that's the processing. So they actually don't produce too much of it themselves. So what happens at the moment is at your mine site in Australia or in South America, you'll produce a lithium concentrate that lithium concentrate will then more often than not get shipped to China to be processed into battery quality materials. So it needs to be upgraded effectively and purified. And that refining pretty much solely happens in China at the moment. And that's a big part of the value chain. It also has a significant impact on the kind of embodied carbon emissions within that lithium, because more often than not in China, that's powered by fuel powered plants. And so producing these, you know, these refined lithium quality battery chemicals actually has a significant power input. These might then be shipped to South Korea to be made into battery cells, shipped back to America to be put into a Tesla, then shipped back to Europe. And I read a stat a couple of months ago that the average distance traveled by lithium, the lithium in a car battery in Europe could be 50,000 kilometers before the car has driven a single mile. So these global supply chains are fantastic, but actually maybe we should start to think about producing some of these things closer to home, capturing some of that value chain if we can, and making sure that we're doing this in a low carbon, environmentally responsible way. So checking my watch, I think we're okay for time. This is, so lithium at the moment is kind of extracted in two, from two main sources, from hard rock sources, which is more of your traditional mining, and then from solution. 
So this is a photo of a mine in West Australia called Green Bushes. And when I was doing my master's at Campbell School of Mines, we were lucky enough to go on a mine tour of Western Australia. And we went on a tour of Green Bushes. And this was kind of before the lithium boom started. And even looking at this aerial photo, which is still a couple of years out of date now, it had grown significantly. And it's probably most akin to quarrying. It's open pit, they drill, they blast, they collect the rock, crush it down, and then they'll produce a mineral concentrate and then that will get shipped to China for extra processing. In contrast, you also have a significant amount of production at the moment from salar deposits. So these are salty brine deposits that form in really arid environments. So places such as the Atacama Desert in Chile are, are perfect for this. They've got lithium rich volcanic rocks. They used to have a lot of water. It's evaporated off. And so you get these salty brines that form anywhere from 200 meters below the surface up to the surface. So they pump them up to the surface and put them into these huge evaporation ponds. And these evaporation ponds can be quite expensive to set up because they've all got to be lined with an impermeable barrier. And to give you a sense of scale from the front of this photo to the pond at the back, I think that's five kilometers. So these things are huge. Um, so obviously they're fairly expensive to set up, but once they have been set up, you're just relying on solar evaporation. So water evaporates off, the solution gets saltier and saltier, your lithium gets more and more concentrated until after about 18 months or two years, you'll then have your mineral concentrate to then do a little bit of processing too before you ship off to China to be refined. And this has, you know, it has a lot of impacts associated with it in such water scarce areas, water sensitive areas, evaporating off, I think over 80% of the water gets lost, to the, you know, gets lost to the atmosphere through evaporation. So it's a fairly significant impact. And these are in really water, water sensitive areas. On the flip side, this would not be feasible in somewhere like Cornwall, because although the weather's lovely at the moment, it rains far too much here. So we're looking at technologies that can directly extract the lithium from solutions. The other thing to note is that um, in South America, these cell art brines are well known for having high magnesium contents and magnesium behaves, you know, it's a, a similar sign to lithium. So actually separating the two out separately is quite difficult. Whereas what we're seeing in Cornwall is that actually relatively, although our lithium concentrations might be a bit lower than you get in South America, relatively our magnesium concentrations are significantly lower. So from a processing point of view, that should be an advantage. So I mentioned that we're looking at direct lithium extraction processing techniques. And that's because the main focus of our exploration here in Cornwall is looking for lithium contained within geothermal waters. And in the last few years, huge advances have been made in processing technologies because there's this increasing global demand for lithium. There's a desire to look for new deposits in different parts of the world. And actually there's significant potential in geothermal waters, we think. And so this is just, you can see at the bottom, there's a list of different companies who've developed different proprietary technologies. We're talking to a few of them and a few that actually aren't listed on here to see what might be suitable for the geothermal waters that we've got at the moment. But basically, we're still at such an early stage of exploration that we're not hanging our hats on any one particular technology at the moment. Oh, actually, before I move on, um, I mentioned that actually lithium in geothermal waters is looking like it's got a lot of potential now. And I wanted to say that in one of, the, one of the areas of the world that's doing a lot of research into this is the Salton Sea in California. And there was some research put out by the Californian Energy Commission last year, I think it was, where they and Berkshire Hathaway Energy have 10 enhanced geothermal system, geothermal plants operating in the Salton Sea area. And they did a back of the envelope calculation whereby they estimate that the value of the lithium that's circulating in their geothermal plants is 10 times the value of the energy that those plants are going to produce over their lifetime. So they're looking at retrofitting lithium extraction technology to those energy plants, as I understand. That's all well and good. So what are we looking at in Cornwall? Well, this is from uh, the US Geological Survey. They do a really good lithium brief that comes out every couple of years and they map out prospective areas for lithium. And so 
The main source of lithium previously has been from these lithium, cesium, tantalum pegmatites. So these are the red squares that you can see. And this tends, tends to be the mineral spodumene. So you get an enriched granite and your pegmatite forms as it cools slowly, and you get these big crystals of spodumene. That's not what we have in Cornwall. Rather in Cornwall, we've got one of these lithium enriched granites instead. So it's kind of the bulk of the granite is more enriched in lithium than your standard granite. And this granite that you have in Cornwall kind of is quite a big beast. It lies, it forms all the topographic highs in the area. So if people know it from Dartmoor, Bodmin, all the way through to Land's End and actually the Isles of Scilly as well, the little granite outcrops. And although where you have these topographic highs is where it outcrops at the surface, the granite batholith actually lies underneath the entire county. That's all well and good. So we've got a lithium enriched granite, underlies the entire county of Cornwall, and it's hot. But what does that mean? So lithium was actually first identified in Cornwall within hot springs in 1864. So historically, Cornwall was mined significantly for copper and then for tin, and they used to have to dewater the mines. So the engine houses that you can see at the top left here were pumping away to dewater the mines. And some of that water was meteoric water, so it'd be rainwater that kind of fell on the surface and trickled down. But a significant portion of that water actually came from what they used to term hot springs. And these hot springs particularly used to plague the deep mines. And effectively, they were driving a, driving a tunnel across under, underground, they'd hit a permeable geological feature, and hot water would upwell along that feature. And it's these hot springs, as they used to call them, uh, that are the geothermal water targets now. And a lot of work was done into them in the 19th century because actually these hot springs could be 45, 50 degrees C at 500 meters beneath the surface. And if it's 100% humidity, it made working conditions absolutely unbearable. And at some of the deep mines in central Cornwall, central Cornwall where some of these hottest springs were, you know, People used to work just 15 minutes at the face of the mine, and that was it before they had to go up. Anyway, so in 1864, Professor Miller of King's College in London decided to do some geochemistry on these hot springs from these deep mines. And he took samples from Wheel Clifford, so United Mines in central Cornwall. They had a hot spring on what's called the hot load, imaginatively, because it was really hot to work there because of all the upwelling hot water. He took some samples, tested it, and found that it was significantly enriched in lithium. And he wrote a paper which basically said, this could be a potential source of lithium if only we had a use for it. So fast forward 150 years, and here we are. And just as a little bit of detail, this is from that top left part of the map there. You can see that they've got little stick men that they've drawn and they put so much detail in. And these guys are swinging a punch at each other on the right and somebody running off a wheelbarrow. It's beautiful, it's really cool. So in Cornwall, we're targeting two geological settings for lithium. The first is looking for lithium contained within these geothermal waters. And second, we're actually assessing the potential for lithium contained within mica minerals in the granite itself. And to that end, we've just finished, literally, I think I said earlier, we finished the two drill programs two days before lockdown started, which is brilliant. Um, our first drill program, was two diamond holes down to about a thousand meters where we targeted a number of permeable geological features in that part of Cornwall where you know lithium was originally found in these hot springs and we hit a number of permeable horizons we produced fluid from them we've sent them up for sampling and you know they've got encouraging amounts of lithium in and the temperatures were pretty much what we predicted which is really exciting we also just did a 41 hole just a shallow 40 meter hole program in an old China clay pit, looking at the potential for lithium within the mica minerals and the granite itself. And that's also actually been a lot more exciting than we thought it was going to be. So just to kind of wrap up, I've touched on the potential that we think there is for lithium contained within geothermal waters. And that's exciting for two reasons. One, because you know, if there's geothermal plants already in production around the world and you can tap on to producing lithium from them, that's great. But actually, if you can co-produce geothermal energy and use some of that to produce your lithium from those same fluids, there's the potential for it to actually be net zero carbon as well. 
Um, there's a company called Vulcan Energy in Germany who are doing really good work around this. And we think Cornwall's got real potential for it. We're not on a, you know, a tectonic margin, so not, we're not somewhere like Iceland or the Rift Valley in Africa, but we have got hot rocks and it means you need to drill deeper down than you would in other parts of the world. But actually, there's a company called United Downs Deep Geothermal who drilled down to 5.2 kilometers this time last year. And, you know, they hit temperatures of 190 degrees C and are in the process of doing their final test work and building a geothermal power plant on it. And that's literally 200 meters from down the road from where we've been doing our drilling and finding significant lithium. I've got 30 seconds, so I'll leave you to read this yourself. But the final thought to take away is that actually, if we can, what I think is the really exciting part for Cornish Lithium, is if we can co-produce geothermal energy, produce lithium from it, I think that'll just be such an exciting opportunity for the county. And yeah, and what we've been seeing is that there's a really linear relationship between the deeper you go, the hotter it gets, the hotter these fluids are, and the higher the lithium content. So yeah, thanks very much for listening. 10 seconds over, sorry. Wow, thank you. That was very impressive, Lucy. You're within your 20 minutes and uh, I'm sure everyone will agree. Absolutely excellent uh, presentation there with uh, some really fascinating thoughts and, uh, and, and, and things that are going on down in Cornwall. So I'm going to open the floor to questions now. We've got uh, 20 minutes. I'm going to set my timer for that. Um, so who can I, I don't see very many hands raised, but keep keep them coming in, folks. Um, well, here we are. I've got a question from Christopher Banks. Christopher, would you like to go ahead? Hi, Lucy. Thanks for that. I just wanted to know if you could share with us any, and you, and you may not be able to, any insights as to what your future exploration program looks like? Where where do you go from here? So the the concept looks really really good, but you know, how do you get from your two thousand meter holes to production? What's that roadmap look like? Oh, thanks for the question. Very good question, and something we're having a lot of discussions about at the moment because there are there are a few options available to us. So where where we've done those first two holes looking for lithium in shallow waters, I think our next steps there will probably be to actually produce from them for a longer time. So although we sampled these permeable geological horizons as we went down through them, we used a system of packer tests and produced from, you know, a definite horizon, which was you know, technically very interesting. What we'd like to do is actually pump from those horizons and kind of get more information as to what the flow rates are, how consistent the lithium mineralization is, which actually was surprisingly consistent throughout the horizons. And with the aim of, so that would probably take a year or so and we'd like to get a pilot plant trialing probably a couple of these extraction technologies on that site so I think the other thing to add is although those sites although that site was chosen because it we knew that historically there had been lithium in these hot waters and that they had particularly permeable geological structures it isn't necessarily the best place in Cornwall for it we just needed to prove the concept that there are permeable geological structures with fluids circulating in them that you can tap into and they've got some lithium in. So I think we've ticked all of those boxes with this first program, but now we need to kind of move up through that. So yeah, I think the aim would be to get a pilot plant, trial a couple of extraction technologies. We've also got a PhD student working with us, at, you know, developing our own extraction technologies. And one of our directors is, he, he does mineral processing. So we're looking at lots of different options for that. So a pilot plant, and then we look to go into full production. But there's also the potential to tie into the deep geothermal project that's down the road, potentially. Um, so yeah, lots of options on the table at the moment. I don't know if that gives you a clear answer, sorry. Yeah, no, that's great, thanks. I just wanted to know like, you know, what you do next, but a production test seems perfectly logical. Yeah, and, um, and in parallel to that, I mean, our kind of prospectivity mapping and coming up with targets for future drilling sites is ongoing. So we've got other sites on the short list now that we want to drill at as well, so. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you, Christopher. Um, I've got another question here from Luca. Luca, would you like to ask your question? Yes, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for a great presentation, Julie. Um, 
my question is about the sustainability. You know, um, you said uh, mining uh, and all lithium and other minerals will key to the energy transition. Mm-hmm. But I wonder if you can share some um, insight or view on uh, the level of emissions uh, from the mining industry and if there are programs to try to reduce that, but also about the recyclability of lithium or other materials. And, you know, there's a, again, it's uh, not a renewable source, just like oil and gas is not a renewable unless yeah. uh, we recycle them. So sustainability and recyclability. I'm just dropping that down because I forget. So first of all, talking about sustainability, there is, I think, a huge opportunity for the mining industry to become more sustainable. And like you said, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because is extracting a finite resource ever going to be truly sustainable? Probably not. But then that comes into how can you recycle it? Um, I think there's something like four or five percent of all the world's power consumption at the moment goes on crushing rocks, communition, which is crazy. So if we can be more efficient with what we're mining and how we're extracting it, then I think there's, you know, there's opportunities for gaming then. So for example, not related to lithium, but for other hard rock metals such as copper, cobalt, they quite often form in these steeply dipping narrow veins. And there's some really exciting technologies out there that are kind of, you know, they're kind of almost like earthworms that can kind of munch the vein as they go down and they can self steer through so that they stay in the sulfide mineralization and they kind of poop it up back at the top where it goes into a little processing plant and then you can backfill behind so you can be much more efficient in what you're mining, minimize that waste as far as possible, which then obviously means that you're not crushing 90% of rock that you don't need. Um, And for us, for lithium, so there's the two sources of lithium that we're looking for. So one is in geothermal waters. So I think this has the opportunity to be the most green way of producing it. And I think I mentioned a company called Vulcan Energy who've been doing fantastic work on kind of promoting lithium and geothermal waters. They're in Central Europe, they're in Germany. And we've, as well as them, we've also been using life cycle assessments. I don't know if you've come across that as a tool before but it's a way of comparing what's the carbon impact of producing a material a certain way, what's the climate change impact, what's the water impact, and there's many different impact categories that you can, you can choose, and it works out what, you know, you, it means that you can compare what's lithium produced from this source like compared to using lithium that's produced from this source and in this way, and one might be much better for water consumption, but actually then, you know, this one might have a much more embodied carbon emissions. And what we're seeing is that producing lithium from geothermal energy can have a really positive impact. And I mean, Vulcan lithium are marketing themselves as net zero carbon lithium. (laughs) Um, So, so yeah, I think through the use of life cycle assessments, I think they're going to become more and more important in the mining industry to actually for consumers as well. So higher up the supply chain to allow them to compare actually how responsible is this raw material that we're using because you know we've got all of these low carbon technologies that's great but if they've got such high embodied impacts and emissions associated with setting them up then actually that probably kind of mitigates that so tapping into the recyclability question at the moment lithium isn't that well recycled so we're but it's something we've been talking about quite a lot so cornish lithium is involved in a UK government funded project, people drilling outside. Um, Cornish Lithium, we've got some funding alongside the Natural History Museum and a local mining consultants called Wardell Armstrong. It's to do an 18 month project looking at whether it will ever be viable to establish a lithium production industry in the UK for use in the UK battery and automotive industries. And as part of that, we're looking at recycling because, you know, in 10 years time, there's going to be a lot of lithium ion batteries out there that need recycling. So is it going to be or would it be possible for, so when you recycle a lithium ion battery, you get a thing called the black mass. And it's this black mass that has the lithium in it, the copper, the cobalt, all of the kind of interesting things. And at the moment, I don't think it's economically viable for most people to extract those metals, which seems ridiculous. Some of the high value ones, yes, but lithium, not so much. But obviously that's going to have to change because there's all the environmental impacts associated with it and disposing of it also is very difficult. So there's a lot of research going on that we've 
kind of been aware of through this project that's looking at making it more easy to recycle these metals that to recover these metals that were within these lithium ion battery black masses. Um, I think we're still a way off from it, but I think it's, it's probably going to get there. And there's also things like the European Battery Alliance and there's the battery directive, which are kind of putting into, you know, it's mandating that you need to recycle X amount of material that's in production. So I don't know if that fully answers your question, but, but hopefully there's some food for thought. It, it, it does. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think there's a lot of work to do and uh, surprising maybe that is not already happening because there is already a lot of lithium uh, um, batteries being in need of recycling. Are... The mobile phones we've been using for the past 10 years. Yeah, well, no, absolutely. So there are lots of lithium ion batteries in circulation already, but, you know, they tend to be in mobile phones and gadgets that people haven't used. Like, I think we're probably all guilty of having an old mobile phone sitting in the cupboard at home rather than having sent it off to be recycled. And I think it's as electric vehicles start to become more and more of a thing, their battery packs are just so significantly bigger. They contain so much more lithium in them than in your mobile phone. And so I think that's when the real, that's where it's now that that real impetus to recycle on a big scale is kicking in. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Thank you, Lisa, that was a really comprehensive Answer. So we've got time for a couple more questions and I've got a question here from Dave Russell. Dave, would you, if you want to give me a thumbs up if you're happy to, uh, to ask your question. So I can actually see your thumb coming up here actually. On the <laughs> oh yes, here we are. I'm going to allow you to talk now. Dave, go ahead. <laughs> hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, and I think, to be honest, you, you've partially answered my question with your last answer. What I was going to say was over, over my career, the UK became self-sufficient in oil and gas. Over your career, could you see the UK becoming self-sufficient in lithium? Ooh, very good question. Um, I don't know that we'll be completely self-sufficient in it if I'm honest, mm -hmm. um, purely because, so I was on a, listening to a webinar the other day with, um, so it's, it says kind of industry consultants called Benchmark Minerals, who are kind of the gurus on lithium demand, who's producing what, battery mega factories, everything. And they were interviewing a guy called Dan Quayle from the government. And some of the figures and statistics that they were saying for UK lithium demand, what it's going to be in the next 10, 20 years were kind of mind, blog mind boggling actually. Mm -hmm. So I think it's probably doubtful that we'll be able to have all of it sourced from the UK. I think a significant portion, yeah, maybe up to a third, um, but we're still going to have to rely on these global supply chains. But I think what we're seeing anyway is, especially in light of the corona crisis, there seems to be an increasing desire from government to start to see if we can source some of these critical raw materials ourselves because at the moment there's such a huge reliance on china um, that i think government's getting slightly nervous at that and even if you look at the battery mega factories that are being built in europe the vast majority of them even though they're being built in europe are actually owned by chinese companies so yeah there's a kind of interesting balance going on at the moment good thanks Great, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for your question. I was thinking on, along a similar line, and I've got um, another question here actually um, from Vinny, uh, who's, uh, who's from the OGTC as well. And actually, I know Vinny's in, he's in India. Let's see if I can put him put him on the line. <laughs> it's very international. It is very international. Here we are, <laughs> Vinny. I'm going to unmute you. He says confidently going on with my screen actually here of everybody I see it's jumping around I, I saw Vinny's name there a second ago anyway I, maybe I have to read this question out because I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to get the oh here we are here we are here we are Vinny right Vinny please go ahead yeah can you hear me yeah yes yeah, sorry that was a kerfuffle <laughs> no oh, thank you Lucy I think it was a fantastic presentation and quite enjoyed it and what a striking was your sentence what uh, if it's if it doesn't uh, if it's not grown, it's mined. I think uh, that was really striking. Uh, but my question is uh, on, on the overall mining industry. And uh, clearly, we know that the mining industry faces a reputational crisis and is seen as one that takes more than it gives. 
So my question basically is, is a social enterprise business model in the need of the day where community buy-in and social license to operate should count as top considerations? Uh, what are your views on that? Sorry, I think I missed a couple of crucial words in that. Oh, okay. My question basically is, is a social enterprise business model the need of the day where community buy-in and social license to operate should count as top considerations for the mining industry? Oh, that is a very interesting question. I like that. So if we break that down into two parts. Social operate. So social license to operate is kind of this entangled thing, but if you don't have it, you can't have a project. And how on earth do you measure that? So I think it is growing increasingly important that companies need to not be dicks. And I don't know how, you know, in the past, people have had this idea that a mining company, it'll come in, take the resources, communities will be left with nothing apart from a big scar on the landscape. But actually things are changing and a lot of companies are doing good now. I think part of the problem lies in, you know, the industry isn't a good advocate for itself. We don't go out there and engage with people talking about this and what people are doing well and okay we built a mine but there was also a school a hospital the local population have been upskilled and actually now they're working internationally on different mine sites and then it was closed and it became a, a you know a nature park that doesn't make headlines so i think when people tend to hear about the mining industry in the news it tends to be big negative things such as that awful tailings dam collapse that happened in brazil not so long ago so i think on one hand that makes people more nervous of the mining industry so if somebody hears that a mine's going to open down the road from them, they might be nervous of it because they tend to have negative connotations with mining. And there's this real disconnect that exists in society between with what we're using and where it comes from. And I also think that as the world's getting more and more connected, people have all got mobile phones now and access to the internet, even in the most remote places. And so can be more vocal about when people are doing things wrong, which is why social license to operate is becoming more and more important, as it should do. Um, you know, there are some really resource rich countries out there where if they can develop them responsibly, so look at Norway and oil, for example, it can be a huge, huge opportunity for them. So I think, yeah, mines can only happen if they've got this social license to operate. And that's an ongoing thing as well. And then the second part of that question was getting community buy-in to projects, I think, which I think is a really interesting concept. And it's something that we looked at at Cornish Lithium last year. Um, and we actually did a crowdfunding round. So we raised 1.4 million pounds last summer from the local community. So, which I think is the first time a mining company has done it successfully. So I think in Cornwall, we're quite lucky because the mining industry only closed relatively recently and people still remember it as, you know, it gave a lot of employment to people in the area and people have got fond memories of their dads working down the mine. Uh, somebody painted my house yesterday and he worked in South Crofty until it closed. And so um, he was telling me all of his mining stories and it was, it was brilliant. Um, so I think in Cornwall, it's slightly different to if we were trying to open you know, start an extractive industry in other parts of the country, purely because it's still in living memory that actually the mining industry was a good thing. It's kind of in the Cornish blood. Obviously, that's not something we're taking for granted at all. And we want to be as open and transparent and responsible as possible, but it's a head start. And so in the first couple of years that Cornish Lithium was going, so we started, in two, we started our exploration in earnest in 2017, we had over 600 people write in through our info at email address saying, can I invest in the company? Um, and so when we were looking to raise money last year, our directors decided that actually, you can only say no to people so many times before they might start to get a bit offended. So we thought, well, you know, we'll try, we'll try crowdfunding. We put our target as a million pounds, which we thought was quite punchy. And actually the interest from people was overwhelming and we raised 1.4 million pounds and a lot of that was from local people who feel like now they've actually got a stake in the company, which makes you feel very responsible when we're out and about in the community and down at the pub, when we used to be able to go to the pub. But actually, I think that responsibility is a really good thing. So local people do have ownership of our project. Um, and I think that, yeah, it'd be great if we can replicate that in other parts of the world as well. 
Thank you so much. That was that was that's fascinating. I'm I'm really impressed. To raise one point four million from the community. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, do they then have a? Is it very, are they very supportive in other ways? I mean, you know, do they always asking you how it's going and they want to know and they're from, yeah. Yeah, we've been trying to. So fairly recently, we sent you know our CEO sent a video update to all of the shareholders and things like that. So we're trying to keep engaged with people, mm-hmm. and yeah, well, we 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 spent the money that we raised in the summer on our two drilling programs. <laughs> so yeah, um, is what we said with it. Um, I had, a, I had another a little question came to mind here really, which is with regard to the old mine workings that you've got, are they, how are they a help, but how are they perhaps a hindrance to, to future mining operations for, for Cornish lithium? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question as well. So Cornwall is riddled with mines. I think they reckon there are at least 3000 mines across the county. Mm-hmm. And you know that's, that translates to thousands of miles of tunnels underneath underneath the surface. It's literally like a rabbit warren. Um, so, from on one perspective, that's really useful for us because there is so much exploration. Uh, there's so much information about the subsurface, and a lot of it's really detailed and really accurate. So, on one hand, we're doing greenfield exploration down here because we're looking for lithium, and people haven't looked for that before. On the flip side, it's kind of brownfield exploration because we actually have a significant amount of information about the subsurface in three dimensions that means we have to drill a lot less. Mm-hmm. Um, so from that perspective, from a researchy side of things, it's great that we've got so, much, so many old mines. For actually extracting materials, there's two prongs to it. So for lithium in hard rock, Um, we'd be looking at kind of open pits to extract it. And actually the part of Cornwall where it's most prospective for extracting lithium from the hard rock itself is in the St. Austell area. And that's where they've been extracting China clay for, you know, it still employs 900 people in the region. There's big open pits in operation. And that's the area that's most, you know, that's got the most potential for lithium hard rock. So I think that was kind of, oh, is that time? That was my timer. Well, I would would like to squeeze one quick question in. Um, Michael Ferris, if you've got, if you've got, you've got the floor, we can squeeze you in because I was aware I took the floor though from you. Go ahead, Michael. You're 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 unmuted. Oh no, you're <laughs> unmuted. Sorry. Thank thank you for unmuting me, um, Lucy. That was a superb presentation. I did raise a question um, before the meeting, and it hasn't come up. Um, I'm assuming that the hot springs that you're exploiting actually come originally from percolated surface water. I just wondered whether you had a feel for how sustainable the flow will be in terms of concentration and will it be diluted each time you you extract something? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's something we're putting a lot of thought into at the moment. So yeah, so what we're seeing is that there's a different geochemical fingerprint between these kind of old, deeper, stored groundwaters that have been there for quite a long time and meteoric water. And if we plot our samples from different depths, we can see a really nice linear mixing relationship between the two. Um, so that's, that's the kind of first point. Um, these hot springs that we're interested in, some of them were measured for 30 years and flowed at 30 litres a second for that 30 years at a consistent temperature of 50-ish degrees Celsius. And so from that and a consistent geochemistry as well, which suggests that it's a fairly significant plumbing system. The best way for, I mean, thinking about recharge times is something we're doing a lot of thinking about. So we are involved in some research that's happening at UCL, which is looking at how long does it take the lithium to move from the microminerals that it's contained in in the granite into the warm water that's passing through it, um, which is interesting. But our best proxy is actually through looking at these enhanced geothermal system power plants that are already in production. So there's some in the Rheingraben, for example, in France and Germany, and they do tracer tests to see, basically, once water's passed through the power plant, how long does it take for that same water to return through the power plant? More often than not, in the past, they've actually used lithium as a tape, as a tracer, but... Um, Obviously, we won't be using lithium because that would mess up our results. But what they're seeing is that it can take three to five years for that water to come back 
through the power plant and that on average I think it's 80 to 90 percent of fresh water coming through the plant at any one time so it seems to suggest it's actually a really big plumbing system and so in that respect we're not too worried about the recharge time at the moment and in addition they've been sampling the geochemistry of the power plant for you know 20 years and actually the lithium grades that they've been seeing are fairly consistent throughout that what happens when you start to extract it i'm not sure but if it's this big plumbing system and lots of water coming through it then hopefully it's this new water that we'll be targeting rather than waiting for it to be refreshed if that makes sense yes very um, very much so yeah. that's uh, it sounds like this is an incredible system going on with the geothermal and the lithium and, and and all the existing and i also detect quite a lot of analogies with with our oil and gas industry yeah and, Sort of taking you know taking things on in a sustainable way um with with our energy transition well i'm sorry folks but we've really reached the end of the 20 minutes and um i just wanted to say thank you very much to lucy that was just absolutely fascinating um i think that you had a everybody was listening intently they didn't have time to get any questions in for you there but we had a couple of really great questions and uh, it shows a little bit more about what cornish lithium is doing on the side if anybody wants to find out more please uh, head over to LinkedIn and you can uh, continue your discussions with Lucy there. There's a QR code which you can scan and it takes you to, your, uh, to, the, to our Tech 20 virtual schedule. The next one is on Friday next week at 11 a.m. So please complete the survey at the end of the webinar and, and give us your feedback. Hope you've enjoyed today. Hope to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks Welcome. very much.